everyone. I'm Ilana Snyder, the President of the New Israel Fund Australia. Welcome to all 300 of you to a very special evening, an opportunity to hear from NIF Australia's co-patron, Dr. Martin Indig. Martin was US Ambassador to Israel during the Clinton administration and the US Special Envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations during the Obama administration. Now it's 8.30 in the evening here for us in Australia, but 6.30 in the morning for Martin in the US. So we thank you, Martin, for getting up so early to speak to us. It's Martin will be joined in conversation by our Executive Director, Liam Petroy, and I'll leave it to Liam to tell you more about Martin and Dick's extraordinary career before the two of them embark on a conversation about Israel-US relations and prospects for peace. Now, these past three months have been trying for all of us, but they've revealed what a tight-knit community we are. We're grateful for your continued support for NIF during the COVID crisis. We found ourselves in a bizarre state of confinement, which only recently began to open up. But this strange moment has offered us unexpected opportunities to fortify the bonds of our new Israel Fund community. Many of us have felt this connection in the Zoom sessions and webinars with more to come. We feel energized by the challenge these times have presented, recognizing what NIF can and must do to defend democracy in increasingly illiberal times. It's not a moment to let down our guard, neither in observing the rules aimed at defeating the virus, nor in succumbing to rising anti-democratic trends worldwide. It's a moment to take note of the remarkable community we have. Now, since it was created in the late 1970s by Ellie Friedman and Jonathan Cohn in San Francisco, NIF has raised more than $400 million to support nonprofits in Israel. Ellie and Jonathan created a partnership between diaspora Jews and Israelis to promote a more inclusive, just, and equitable society. NIF is has evolved into a vibrant and critically important movement supporting progressive change in Israel, informed by the belief that Israel should be a shared, equitable, and democratic land. NIF was established in Australia just nine years ago, and in less than a decade, we've raised millions of dollars to support projects in Israel, and we've also worked hard to broaden the conversation in Australia about Israel. Our NIF community is made up of people who come together to make a real impact on the ground in Israel. The primary objective of our work is to bring Israel closer to its founding ideals of equality, democracy and inclusion. And to realise our vision, we partner with Israeli nonprofits to raise funds for their projects. Let's take just two recent successes of the amazing organisations we support. The first is ACRI, the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, NIF's flagship organisation. Following ACRI's petition, the High Court of Justice has struck down the expropriation law of 2017 that permitted the government to confiscate privately owned Palestinian land in the West Bank. The second organization is Physicians for Human Rights. Sensitive to the plight of asylum seekers and migrant workers at all times, but particularly during the COVID crisis, Physicians for Human Rights has run an open clinic for these vulnerable, marginalized populations. Well, it's now time for me to say goodbye and to welcome Martin Indyk and Liam Gatroy to begin what promises to be a most timely and important conversation. Thank you so much, Ilana. Uh, you gave the best highlights of, uh, of Martin's CV. And so now what I will hand over as much as possible during the evening to Martin, thank you so much for joining us. You've been a board member of the New Israel Fund. You've been a patron of uh, you've been a patron of the New Israel Fund Australia since basically we started. You were a champion of NIF in Australia uh, when we were really only just a dream of things that we were trying to set up and talk about in the Australian Jewish community. Uh, so I'll pass on to you. You're going to start us off with a bit of an update on what's been happening uh, in, the last, uh, uh, in the last few hours, it seems. Thank you, Liam. Good morning, everybody. Good evening to you. Uh, Thank you, Ilana. It's wonderful to see how NIF has grown in Australia uh, from just an idea that uh, we first had years ago to the strong organization that it has become uh, under your leadership and under Liam's leadership. I'm very proud to be associated uh, with you and your work uh, couldn't be uh, more important. Uh, I'm uh, here in Washington, although I live in New York uh, uh, in uh, normal days, and these are far from normal days, of course. Uh, the coronavirus uh, here in uh, the United States is uh, still wreaking havoc in its uh, first wave with the spread to the south. 
Uh, yet today or tomorrow, it's a little vague as to when it's going to happen, uh, the president, uh, Donald Trump, is going to meet with his peace process advisors to decide uh, on the fate of the Jewish and democratic state of Israel. Um, it's unusual in the history of the Zionist enterprise that uh, the fate of the nation, the fate of the Zionist project should be placed in the hands uh, of people uh, outside of Israel. And yet that is uh, where we've come and, and what people. Um, we have a, a two evangelicals, uh, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, and Mike Pence, the Vice President. Uh, two Jews, uh, David, actually three Jews, two, David Friedman, uh, who is uh, nominally the US ambassador to Israel, but he is actually the US ambassador to the settler movement uh, in Israel. Um, Avi the envoy, Avi Berkowitz, very nice guy, a young man who has, of course, like the others, zero experience in, in making a peace or dealing with uh, these complex uh, and difficult issues, but he's the special envoy. Jared Kushner, the son-in-law, uh, who has devised uh, this uh, Trump uh, peace plan, vision for peace and prosperity, they now call it. Uh, in uh, cahoots with uh, Ron Derma, the, the Israeli ambassador to the United States, uh, who have basically embraced uh, Bibi Netanyahu's plan uh, for a, a two-state solution and what he calls the Palestinian state minus. Uh, and uh, then, of course, there's Donald Trump, a serial breaker of international agreements, who is now considering whether he should endorse a decision by Israel to break uh, international law, uh, Israel's commitments under the Oslo Accords, and Israel's commitment to UN Security Council Resolution 242. The Oslo Accords state very clearly that neither side shall take unilateral acts that affect the status of the territories. And UN Security Council Resolution 242 states very clearly in its preamble, as I'm sure you all know, that it's inadmissible to acquire uh, territory by force. Um, that's, that's a principle that uh, Vladimir Putin has broken in his annexation of Crimea and is being sanctioned by the United States for doing so. But it's a principle that uh, Donald Trump is going to be asked today or tomorrow to uh, endorse, uh, to, I'm sorry, to endorse the breaking of it uh, in order for Israel to go ahead with annexation. Um, and if uh, we can go by his own testimony, I don't know how many of you heard this, but after he decided to uh, recognize Israel's uh, sovereignty over the Golan Heights, uh, the first breach of, of international law here, uh, he described to a Jewish audience in Las Vegas, in the presence of Sheldon Adelson, uh, how he did it. And uh, so we can kind of imagine how it's going to go today. He said that uh, he asked Friedman and Kushner to give him a quickie. Now, especially in Australia, we have an understanding of what a quickie means, but he meant a quickie briefing because he can't sit still for a long briefing. So he got a quickie briefing about how uh, this had never been done before. Well, he liked that. And uh, he, he had the power to go ahead and, and, and recognize Israel's sovereignty. And uh, he said, oh, okay, well, I'll do it. And so I can imagine that that's uh, what's going to happen uh, in the next 24 or 48 hours. Uh, but maybe not. We can get into that. But essentially, that's where we are uh, today in Washington. How much, there's a few th things that we want to talk about and I encourage people also to write in the Q&A on your Zoom screen if you have any questions uh, that you'd like to put to Martin. How much does Israel's actions rely on some form of green light from the Trump administration? If it's amber, if it's kind of a lukewarm response that they get, which in the beginning of the process, it, it seemed that it was, there was some confusion over just how much they were willing to, uh, to authorize a, a 
seemingly somewhat unilateral, at least, um, uh, annexation plan. How much does Bibi need Trump to say yes in order for it to happen, or can he do it without a formal green, official green light from him? Well, the reason he needs a green light is because it's written into the coalition agreement that he signed with uh, Benny Gantz, the alternate uh, prime minister. It said uh, it has two paragraphs in that agreement on this issue. It's the only issue, policy issue that was addressed in the agreement. And it provides for Netanyahu to bring the decision on annexation to the cabinet. Uh, and if it's not passed in the cabinet, he can go directly to the Knesset. And there's procedures for streamlining uh, Knesset legislation to pass the annexation, provided that it has the approval of the United States. That's in the agreement. So, uh, so I say the United States is going to decide uh, the fate of uh, Israel uh, in, in, in this way. Uh, so he would be breaking the agreement with Getz. Now he may have other reasons for wanting to force this issue and break the agreement with Gantz. Uh, one possibility is that he would want to break the agreement with Gantz because the uh, polling shows that uh, he would wipe Gantz and the Blue and White Party out in the next election. They would only get 12 seats and he would get, I think, 41, whereas he's got 35 now. He would have, be able to form a right-wing government with a majority in its own right, something he hasn't been able to do in the last three elections he's had. Uh, and so he's, you know, he may be tempted to, to break the agreement for, for that reason. Another reason why he may be tempted to break the agreement is that the approval of the United States, at least up until they decide to change it, the approval of the United States, according to Jared Kushner, will only be forthcoming if Gantz agrees to the annexation that Bibi wants to go ahead with, and that both of them commit to the entire Trump plan, which includes the establishment of a Palestinian state. And as you probably know, uh, that is hugely controversial amongst the very people that Bibi uh, decided to do the annexation for. That is the settler movement, uh, something like a half of the settler movement, uh, and certainly the, the Fabrenta settlers, the ones who really have a burning desire to keep all of the land of Israel and they don't agree to establishing a Palestinian state. They don't agree to having 19 of their 131 settle, settlements uh, in enclaves within the so-called Palestinian state. That's what the Trump plan provides for. And uh, they have a real problem with it. They're protesting outside the prime minister's residence uh, because they are so opposed to this. It's so, a particular type of right-wingness to feel that Trump is, uh, is not right-wing enough for you, that like, yes. he didn't quite go far enough with it. Right, because, exactly, because he doesn't understand um, what the evangelicals uh, in his base understand is that God gave all the land to Israel and none to the Palestinians. So, therefore, it's not acceptable um, to have a Palestinian state there. So, let's talk a little bit about some of the functional elements of annexation, because it's Annexation could mean any number of different things. There are any number of different plans. Uh, a few months ago, Benjamin Netanyahu stood in front of a map and said, this is the plan, but it was even then not super clear, I think, what he meant. There are a few core options that he could go with, presumably some of which would be more tolerable for Benny Gantz, with whom he needs in order to stay in government, at least on some level, and the settlers with whom he needs some kind of relationship to govern in the future. So one option would be, a smaller level of annexation of maybe just a few core settlement blocks. And then the more maximal option is, uh, you know, area C, the Jordan Valley. Maybe if you can tease out those two options a little bit and which you think is more likely to achieve what Benjamin Netanyahu wants out of this, I guess. Right. So he is reported to have presented Gantz with four options, four maps uh, of annexation. And, um, the one that, that I think is probably most likely, makes the most sense, let's put it that way, 
uh, is one in which he kind of offers a two-step process. Uh, he decides that he wants to annex all of the settlements, that would be the 131 settlements, extend Israeli law to those settlements. That is something all of the settlers want. Uh, and put off the annexation of the Jordan Valley uh, because that creates a whole uh, range of problems with Jordan and with Jordan's supporters in the Gulf, right, particularly right. the United Arab Emirates. And so mm -hmm. have we been hacked? Can you hear me? Yep, keep going, keep going. We've, uh, we fixed it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was rather dramatic. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I put off the Jordan Valley annexation because that gets him into a lot, a, a world of grief uh, with Jordan, uh, endangers the peace treaty. Gantz is very much opposed to causing any problem for Jordan uh, for strategic reasons and because it's going to create a real problem. Uh, for Israel's relations with at least some of the Gulf Arabs who are supporting Jordan, particularly the United Arab Emirates. And you probably saw recently the UAE ambassador in, in Washington, Yusuf al Taiba, wrote an op-ed published on the front page of Yidiot in Israel saying, Israelis, you like uh, the normalization you're getting from us. Well, you're going to have to choose annexation or normalization, but you can't have both. So it seems to me that would make, that would be the logical thing to do. Settlements now, Jordan Valley later. The other options he has a, uh, to do, uh, as you said, a small one, which would include Malay Adumim, the big city to the east of Jerusalem uh, on the way to the Dead Sea. Uh, and uh, some of the blocks uh, that are, along the old green line uh, between uh, Israel and, and the West Bank. Uh, and, and somewhere, you know, some variation of that Malaya uh, Dumim and the blocks, Gush Etzion and, and the blocks around Jerusalem. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what Gantz would settle on. I think he would like to do from his own point of view, would like to, if there's going to be annexation, would like to annex all of the settlements that are behind the barrier and exclude all of the settlements that are in the heartland of the West Bank. But um, I don't think that Netanyahu will go along uh, with that one. So it remains to be seen. If seeking some form of normalization with the Arab world, particularly as a block against Iran has been a real priority for Netanyahu, particularly over the last 10 years. Why would he risk all of that and all of that ability to say, I'm the regional stability guy? Why would he risk all that for something that he seems at least not to believe full throat in a full-throated way, given that he hasn't done anything about it in the 10 years that he's been prime minister? Is it just domestic political calculations or does he really want this and he's waited for the right time? I agree that it's a bit of a head scratcher, especially when, when you consider his history, which has been to argue that the Palestinian issue is a sideshow. It's not important. You know, we don't need to resolve that conflict. We just need to manage it because the big threat is Iran and Iran's acquisition of nuclear weapons that can present an existential threat to Israel. At this moment, he has all of the Sunni Arab states lined up with him against Iran. And nobody is, is stopping him from continuing his policies of expanding settlements, building more settlements, uh, and not going ahead with uh, any kind of effort to make peace with the Palestinians. So why bring it back onto the agenda and split from the Sunni Arabs that he, that he has built an alliance with, as you point out, against Iran, especially at a moment when Iran is advancing towards building 
rebuilding its nuclear capacity with an enrichment of, of uranium proceeding apace. Uh, and nothing is being done to stop it. Nothing. He's completely Because, of course, there's no agreement. There was an agreement which limited right. it. Now there isn't. <laughs> right. And now there isn't. Now they're going ahead. And now he's shifted attention, to America's attention in particular, away from Iran. Nobody's talking about Iran at this point. So it is, it is bizarre. What is the explanation? Well, I, I think I can say that I know Netanyahu quite well. Really so I've spent a lot of hours with him. And I think that you need to understand that destroying Oslo has been a critical objective of his since the days when he first ran for election against Shimon Peres in 1996 and ran against Oslo. My wife, uh, then wife, used to say that Bibi Netanyahu was sent by the devil to destroy Oslo. And that is what he has been systematically doing since the Y agreement in which we managed to get him to give up 13% of the West Bank and it brought down his government, his first government. And since then, he has sought every possible way to get out of the Oslo uh, commitments. Uh, and now he has a chance to redefine the uh, basis for a two-state solution. He in, in, I know this is going to be hard for people to accept, but he actually does believe in a two-state solution. Uh, he doesn't want to absorb the Palestinians into Israel. He's not like the settlers in that regard. He doesn't want a one-state solution. He wants a state minus. And if you look up his ambassador, Ron Dermer's op-ed piece in the Washington Post that ran this weekend, you will see uh, how he defines two-state solution. They don't reject the two-state solution. They want the two-state solution. And now, but it's according to their definition of it. And he has managed to get through Kushner, Trump to sign off on this plan. This Trump plan is Bibi's plan. It's exactly what he was trying to achieve in all the negotiations I had with him he has fi finally got the American president to endorse this. What is it? It's, it's, it's a state minus territory. Mm. The Palestinians will only have 70% of the West Bank. They won't have the Jordan Valley. It's a state minus sovereignty because the Israeli army, for security reasons, will be free forever to roam in the West Bank and, of course, hold on to the Jordan Valley as Israel's security border to the east. It's a state minus a capital in East Jerusalem, uh, unless you count two outer uh, suburbs, they're not really suburbs, these two towns that, that uh, were never part of original Jerusalem, but it doesn't include any of Arab East Jerusalem, including the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the, the Muslim, Christian quarters of the old city uh, or any of the Arab suburbs uh, of, of Jerusalem, East Jerusalem. Uh, and so that's, that's what he means by a two-state solution. He's redefining it. And if he, he thinks if he can get the United States to endorse this, then, you know, he has succeeded finally in destroying uh, the Oslo Accords. And indeed, Abu Mazen has said, you go ahead with this, the Oslo Accords, Accords are over. So I think that's what his purpose is. If we, if we narrow the definition of two states to be what Bibi thinks it is or what he wants it to be, then a two-state solution will still exist absent the foundations of the Oslo Accords. But if we expand the definition of two states to mean what literally everybody else in the world means by two states, then, I mean, is that dream still alive? Is that still something that we can push towards a state that is viable, a state with a shared capital in Jerusalem, with territorial contiguity, 
with the ability to create an, a, a kind of an economy that allows the Palestinian society to flourish. Um, how, do, how do we move past this? Or is, is it, and also, I guess, is it a matter of um, Trump being in office? Is that what would have to change in order for Bibi to have to walk back to this shared definition of two states? So uh, you can see from what we've been discussing, the way that Netanyahu uh, believes that he can achieve his objective is to get uh, the American uh, recognition of Israel's annexation. Uh, he thinks that that's all that matters, but it's, it's an illusion. Um, what matters is international recognition, not just US recognition. And recognition is something that can be given with the left hand and taken away with the right hand, or actually the other way around. Because if Joe Biden becomes president, and you know, if you look at the situation from where we are today, it's more likely than not that he will become president. He has said that he will withdraw the recognition. And that is in the power of the president. The Congress doesn't decide on matters of recognition. That's how Trump recognized Israel's sovereignty on the Golan Heights, Jerusalem as Israel's capital. That's all in the powers of the president. So Biden can take it away. He won't take away, I believe, uh, recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. But I think he will take away uh, recognition of Israel's annexation. Uh, this is opposed not just by Biden, but by the entire leadership of the Democratic Party. Schumer, Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, Cardin, I mean, all of Israel's staunch allies in the Democratic Party, of which Biden is one, uh, are opposed to this. And that is not only a reflection of their belief that uh, to go ahead with annexation will put Israel on the path towards uh, having to choose between being a Jewish state and a democratic state. And what Israel sold the Democrats was that they were a Jewish and democratic state. They sold it to all of us. Yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, so, so they're committed to that kind of Israel. Uh, but also you have in the Democratic Party today, a strong progressive movement that has made Palestinian one of its causes, uh, the Palestinian state, one of its causes. And um, they are pushing very hard. You saw it in Bernie Sanders' position. You saw it in the way in which all of the presidential candidates had adopted strong uh, position on this. And you see it also in the Jewish community, which is a pillar of the Democratic Party, where the vast majority of American Jews support a two-state solution, to a real two-state solution uh, as well. Uh, so what, what Netanyahu is doing is playing to uh, one part of the American polity, which consists of Republicans and, and their Jewish supporters are a very small minority in the, in the American Jewish community and Trump's evangelical base. This goes against the basic principles of, of Israeli strategy towards the United States since its founding, which is to build bipartisan support amongst the American public and, and on both, both sides of the political spectrum. And so to drive this ahead is to um, not only drive a state through the heart of the, of the Zionist project, but also to destroy the bipartisan foundations of uh, Israel's uh, position in the United States. It's a march of folly. The, the, I mean, the two-state solution, like you've been saying, is the basis of Israel's ability to stay both Jewish and democratic. Let's assume that some form of annexation takes place, uh, that maybe that kind of, you know, all 131 settlements, that it makes a Palestinian state in any kind of reasonable sense very hard to get off the ground. Uh, maybe Trump, God forbid, wins re-election. And so there's no withdrawal of American support for annexation. What happens then to Israel's Jewish and democratic character? What happens 12 months from now when we are, when things are worse and not better? How do we make sure that 
that that if the two state solution is the best way to protect Israel's Jewish and democratic character, has that fallen then totally by the wayside and we need alternatives? Or is it something that we still push for? I think that it's essential um, that people who care about Israel's future as a Jewish and democratic state, that we continue to push for a two-state solution, not for the Palestinians, but for Israel. It's the opposite of annexation is separation. And this was Rabin's vision. You know, I, I, I'm so angry to see Derma invoke Rabin's speech, <clears throat> the last speech he gave to somehow justify this project, which is the opposite of what Rabin intended. Rabin's whole program was to separate from the Palestinians. And, and the words that I will always remember him saying was at the signing of the Oslo II Agreement in which he said, our task is to separate, not out of hatred, but out of respect. That was the essence of, of his project. And by the way, in that speech that Derma quotes in this op-ed, Rabin quotes the Oslo Accords and says, nothing should be done to alter the status of the territories until the final status negotiation. So that uh, is essential to keep the hope to state solution alive. Why? Because any other solution is not a solution. It's just a recipe for the continuation of conflict. The, the bizarre and, and absurd thing about what Netanyahu and Kushner are doing here is that they're making peace between the United States and Israel, not between Israel and the Palestinians. Palestinians are not part of this process. They've been driven out of it by Trump's decision on, on Jerusalem. They've been sanctioned. All American aid, except for $5 million for a hospital in, in East Jerusalem has been cut. And, and now they're being threatened that if they don't come to the table, annexation will go ahead. That's what Kushner is trying to do, trying to lever, lead, use it as a lever but they're not gonna do that. So, so without Palestinian acceptance, Palestinian engagement, um, this is, is simply gonna be a unilateral act and it will not be legitimized by anybody but the uh, Republican president, not by the Democrats in the United States and not by anybody else in the world, maybe Orban in, in uh, Hungary will uh, recognize it, but nobody else is going to recognize it. And certainly not the Arabs, uh, Israel's Arab neighbors, and certainly not the Europeans, Israel's main trading partner. Um, and, and so uh, it, it will have no lasting effect except to, create, to continue to create a kind of one state reality uh, in the West Bank as, as the settlements grow and, and if the Jordan Valley is annexed and so on. So it makes it much harder to actually get to a Palestinian state living in peace alongside Israel. But it, it does not do away with it. And here's the, I think, ultimate irony, although I may be stretching this too far. This process, I believe, to the extent that Israelis are paying attention and the about 5% of them think this is an important issue. To the extent they're paying attention, it's driving home the need to separate from the Palestinians. And there's one little anecdote which I thought was fascinating in this regard. The military administration, the Israeli military administration in the West Bank says that if we go ahead with annexation, we have to do a census of the Palestinians that are in the territories that we're going to annex. Why? There are partly about 10,000 Palestinians that would be in this territory. Why is it so important to do a census? Because they fear that the Palestinians are going to flood into the territories that Israel is annexing in order to get the benefits from being in territories that Israel has annexed, like national insurance and other things that 
Palestinians in East Jerusalem get. And so this kind of drives home the point that Israel is going to end up with responsibility for not a few Palestinians that might have to be admitted as a token under a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the refugee problem, but thousands of Palestinians who will now become a part of the area that Israel has annexed. And, and I think that while it, it is going to drive home to the Israelis the advantage of separation and the problem of annexation, it's going to drive home to the Palestinians that maybe a one-state solution is not a bad idea. And so you, you end up with a dynamic that is, of course, the exact opposite of what was intended. But in the end, I believe it will lead everybody to say, you know what, eventually they'll come around to saying, you know what, maybe separation is what we need. A two -state what, I, I know within um, domestic political circles here in Australia, there is concern that the only other serious Western democratic country to that might either support or not distance itself from any form of annexation is our government here. Um, mm -hmm. There is some concern about that. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, NIF Australia called on uh, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne not to support annexation, to come out publicly and oppose it. Uh, for what it's worth, we never got a reply and uh, we were told we'll never get a reply. Uh, it'll be interesting as things develop, uh, if one is forthcoming, I, I'm not holding my breath, but it leads me to ask you what you think would be the reaction, just how far would even conservative governments like in Britain where um, Boris Johnson has come out extremely uh, hard against Israeli plans. Um, Angela Merkel in Germany, one of Israel's strongest allies has also come out against annexation quite strongly. What do they do? And maybe as a, you know, as an extension of that, what should they be doing? And what sh should we in Australia be hoping or expecting our government to do? Well, I think it's clear, it's, it's not complicated. Governments that care about um, Israel's uh, survival as a Jewish and democratic state, which is not something that, you know, NIF invented. <laughs> that's something that, Israel from its founding decided that that's what it would be. That is the Zionist vision. And so governments that want to ensure a Jewish and democratic state, oh, you know, should, should oppose annexation because it's gonna put Israel on the path of, of having to choose between being Jewish or being democratic. And that, that's very obvious today. So that's, that's it, it's, and, and it's to keep the hope of a two-state solution alive because that's in Israel's vital interest. Do you think they will, I mean, so far we're talking about words. What, do you think they will push further, push for some kind of action? Do you think uh, either Jewish communities, I know in, in Great Britain there are Jewish communities pushing um, the, uh, the Johnson administration to the Johnson government to do something more than just express opposition to it because of all the reasons you outlined? Do you think they'll go further either in international forums, maybe around differentiation of products between products produced inside Israel proper versus those from the West Bank settlements? And kind of what, what, what then reaction do Israelis have when they see, do they think, oh, well, you know, I was used to more freedom, you know, freedom maybe the way I traveled to Europe or I was used to being treated in a certain way, or Israel being treated in a certain way diplomatically by these countries and having that scaled back a bit. What, what reaction do Israelis have? As I say, I don't think Israelis are, are paying any attention right. to this. Um, from, from their point of view, the reality on the ground isn't really going to change at all. Uh, it's hard to imagine, and I certainly wouldn't recommend that Europe imposed sanctions. Um, there, there, uh, but it, I mean, there'll be a push for that uh, among some of them, but I don't think that there would be a consensus for that. Uh, there will be other ways in which they'll show their dissatisfaction. The, the big problem for Israel's scientific community is if the EU stops funding joint research projects. I think that's about a billion dollars worth of research projects 
that could be cut off without a consensus from the EU. And uh, that, that would become a real problem for Israel's scientific community. And that's you know, critical to Israel's high tech uh, future. So uh, there, there could be ways in which that would happen. Uh, there will definitely be moves in the United Nations. Um, but the, in the Security Council, the United States has a veto. And as long as Trump is there, uh, Netanyahu's annexation project will be protected. Uh, but the Palestinians will take it to the UN General Assembly and get an automatic majority of about 140 votes there. Uh, and that will chip away at Israel's international legitimacy. But I don't see anything dramatic happening. The Arab states will go back to their covert relationships um, with Israel. The Jordanian, uh, Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty will become even colder. I don't think it's going to be broken, but it's hard to tell. The big problem will not be in what governments, other governments do. The big problem will be in the quality of the relationship between Israel and the Palestinians that it will now be ruling over forever. At least that's the message that they'll be sending to the Palestinians. And the Pal Palestinian Authority seems to be this time quite serious about collapsing the Palestinian Authority and making Israel responsible for all of the Palestinians, the two and a half million Palestinians that are now under the responsibility of the Palestinian Authority will become Israel's responsibility. And, and um, they're worried. The security establishment in Israel is very concerned about it. And they've spoken out very clearly. This is, again, another example of the march of folly that the Shin Bet uh, and, and the army are saying, this is going to become a real problem for us because it'll start in, their scenario is it'll start in Gaza Hamas, uh, well, not Hamas, but other factors, factions under the control of the Iranians will start again firing rockets and Hamas will have to join in in the hope of provoking violence in the West Bank. Uh, and uh, then the Tanzim, the youth that are organized and not really under Abu Mazen's control, could, could erupt in the West Bank. So even though it hasn't happened up to now, it could happen in these circumstances. And then you will have the international community adopting a very different attitude towards Israel if it's now engaged in suppressing uh, Palestinian demonstrators and, and with a large loss of life involved. So I, I think it, 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 the arenas where it's gonna happen, the most important will be what happens on the ground in the broader Arab world. Then, sorry, Grandson. Who's calling you at seven o'clock in the morning? That's, that's very early. My grandson calls to say good morning. He's uh, nine months old. <laughs> very sweet. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no, that's all right. Anyway, so I think that, and, and then the question is, uh, who's going to be protecting Israel, especially if it moves into international fora uh, and Trump is no longer president and, uh, and, and Biden doesn't endorse what Bibi, what Bibi has done here? Um, I gotta say, we've got almost 300 people on the call. We have more than almost 40 questions in the q and I'm trying to weave as many of these questions into our discussion as we can. I'm sorry that we're not gonna get to anywhere near uh, most of them. Uh, there is a couple of questions here about uh, the Palestinian uh, response, I guess at this part of the process, not after it happens. You said that they were basically excluded from the Trump plan, uh, that you know there's been a, a uh, a withdrawal of diplomatic relationships between the Trump administration and the Palestinians. They have put a somewhat of a response on the table in the last few weeks. Um, and there has been a dialogue, I think, from the Arab world since the Trump plan was even released to say, here is what we would see as an alternative. Um, the Arab peace initiative has been on the table for almost 20 years now, I think. How realistic are those proposals? And if a serious government in Israel were to say, great, here are our partners. It isn't realistic for them to say, here we have, par uh, we have partners in, Israel, in the Palestinian proposals and Arab proposals and to try and go down that path. Is that realistic? Are they real proposals? My Siri just thought I'd asked her a question, but no, I didn't. Continue. <laughs> uh, 
the Palestinians are in a, in a tight corner. They know they don't have Arab support. Um, to the extent that there's Arab support, it's for Jordan. Uh, it's not for the Palestinians. The Egyptians then, usual patrons, have gone completely silent. Saudis and Emiratis um, don't have any time for them. So uh, they know that they can't beat something with nothing and they're struggling to come up with something. Um, they will not accept the Trump plan because the Trump plan, I mean, plenty of people of goodwill are saying to them, look, talk to the Americans, tell them, okay, you said you agreed to a Palestinian state, let's start to define it. You said you agreed to swaps, so let's discuss what the swaps will look like. You said 70%, let's try to get that up to 95% uh, of the West Bank. Sit down, be practical, talk to them. They won't do that um, because the, the Trump plan is the only basis upon which uh, Kushner and his uh, people are prepared to talk to the Palestinians. And they won't accept that basis because that basis decides all of the issues in Israel's favor before the negotiations begin. So uh, they're looking for some international forum. They try to use the quartet as the, as the forum because that has the Russians and the EU and the UN as well as the United States. Uh, but they say the basis for the negotiations should be what it was, what it's been up to now. Uh, 242, 338, Oslo Accords, everything that we've agreed to with Israel and Israel has a contractual commitment to. Uh, and that's, that's not gonna work. Uh, so so they, they don't have a viable way forward. They would like to find a, you know, another secret channel to discuss things with the Israelis directly. Uh, but Netanyahu has no interest in that um, because he's negotiating with the Americans now. He doesn't need the Palestinians. Um, so I think, I think that uh, they, they really don't have any good options. The fact that Abu Mazen would this time seriously contemplate collapsing the Palestinian Authority is a sign of just how... how desperate he's become because that's his life's work in effect. Um, that's his presidency, that's it. you know, so, so to collapse it is to admit that it was all a failure uh, and there's nothing left for him to do then but to kind of go into exile. So I think um, that they're really at, at, at a very low point. And that's where the last time I saw him, which was the day after the Trump plan was uh, announced, um, and he was not in good health, he, um, he said to me, look, I will oppose violence, you know, forever. I'm never going to go in favor of violence. But I'm telling you, it's going to be harder and harder to prevent violence if my people have no hope and this plan is taking away their hope. If Abu Mazen is, is nearing the end. He's, like you said, he's an old guy. He's not in the best of health. What, what comes next for Palestinian leadership then? If he's holding back a little bit, this drive towards violence, who is next? And um, often it's spoken about that maybe the person who has the best ability to be a non-violent, or at least a kind of a call to non-violent voice in Palestinian society is probably sitting in an Israeli jail. Um, is, that, is that true? Who comes next and, and how much can they keep everything from falling apart? I think that Marwan Barghouti is who you're referring to, um, who is a, a popular uh, leader on the Palestinian side, but he's in, in languishing in an Israeli jail and is not about to be released. So I think that, that as the Palestinians look towards a succession to Abu Mazen, they're looking past him um, and focusing uh, more on a number of other players that are kind of emerging. Uh, 
the Prime Minister, Amit Dyer, uh, because of his handling of the COVID-19 crisis, has gained some credibility and visibility. Uh, and, and he's quite articulate, and so he's become a more viable candidate. Um, there's Jibru Raju, people may remember him. He was used to be head of security in the West Bank, and now he's head of the Soccer Federation. Um, and, uh, you know, Saab Arakat, but I think Saab, Saab also is not in great health and not really in, in a good position to challenge the other leaders. There's uh, Mohammed Dahlan, who's out in the Arab Emirates, but once Abu Mazen goes, he would presumably come back to the West Bank. So, you know, there are four or five of them. There's uh, Nasser al-Kidwa, uh, who is uh, Yasser Arafat's nephew. Um, he has a certain legitimacy because of that. He used to be Palestinian representative of the UN. So that four or five are there uh, vying for the leadership. In the end, I guess there'll be a kind of triumvirate for the three positions that uh, Abu Mazen now holds, which is president of the PA, uh, chairman of the uh, PLO and chairman of, of Fatah, the, the political party. Uh, I can imagine three, three guys uh, filling those positions and then uh, a struggle for power that would go on for some time. So we don't have all that long left and uh, it would be remiss of me if I didn't focus in a little bit on the work of the New, New Israel Fund inside Israel, where uh, again, it's an organization for those of you who missed the beginning that you've had a very long association with on the board of the New Israel Fund's global movement, as well as, of course, as our patron here. So much of NI, well, NIF's theory of change is that we invest in Israeli civil society in order to advance equality and democracy. And NIF's done that to the tune of something like $400 million over the last 40 years. How much can the grassroots inside Israel be a force for change and either um, stop annexation from happening, maybe on a political level, or at least uh, through human rights organizations, through the High Court of Justice, uh, how much can it stop at least or limit the damage to both Palestinian human rights inside the West Bank, uh, but also to uh, you know, Israel's democratic character? NIF has a, has a critical role to play within Israel and, and um, in the fight for uh, equal rights uh, in Israel, particularly for disadvantaged uh, minorities, whether it's Ethiopian, uh, religious women, uh, Bedouins, the Arab sector. Uh, there's a huge amount of very important work in Israel uh, to ensure that Israel is true to its Jewish and, and democratic uh, vision. But NIF also has played a critical role and will continue to play a critical role in supporting those organizations that are advocating for human rights and, and Palestinian rights uh, before the Israeli Supreme Court. And many of those uh, efforts to protect the rights of minorities and, and the rights of the Palestinians have been decided in the Supreme Court as a result of cases being brought by NGOs that are being supported by NIF. And the Supreme Court just made a critical decision related to the annexation, uh, which said that, that uh, the Israeli government cannot take away Palestinian private property. as to respect the property rights of Palestinians in the occupied territories. And if Israel annexes, that will be even more the case for the Palestinian property that it annexes. So the battle for uh, the two-state solution is going to continue, uh, particularly in the Supreme Court. Uh, and, and there I think that, you know, it, the NIF can play a critical role. One other dimension of this is, of course, the Arab community in Israel. And they have, they are going through a really important transformation. Uh, this political strength is growing in their representation in the Knesset, and now is the third largest party. Uh, 
And there is growing acceptance within the Israeli body politic that the Arabs of Israel need to be part of the political system, not marginalized by it. And, and NIF has played a critical role in, in that process of strengthening the Arab sector and making the case for equal rights for Arabs. And that will transform as, as it proceeds, and I believe it will proceed because it's gaining greater and greater acceptance within the Jewish majority, that you will then see uh, as a result of that, the Israeli attitude towards the Palestinians are changing as well. Uh, and and uh, they become less threatening and more, uh, more uh, capable uh, uh, to make peace with, to be peace partners. So I think that, that NIF's role is, is critical in every aspect that I've described. Uh, and, and it's really important that, that uh, NIF Australia do what it can to support the efforts. So as we get up to 29 minutes uh, past nine, uh, I will uh, wrap us up a little bit. I have a few last things to say before I thank you properly, Martin. Uh, one is that a big role of what we do here in Australia, in addition to funding those organizations that you referred to, uh, is uh, speak within the Jewish community and also outside of the Jewish community about this important work that's being done in Israel to protect Israel's Jewish and democratic character. Uh, you can uh, see me, for example, on ABC News tomorrow night at about half past 10, where we'll be talking about what NIF's role is in that. Uh, and of course, the biggest thing that you can do as supporters and as of NIF and as members of the NIF Australia community is contribute financially to support these projects that Martin's just spoken about. As you leave the webinar, you'll be directed to a donate page. Many, many, many of you on this call have already generously made donations uh, in this financial year. If you haven't yet, I would urge you to join us as we seek to protect Israel's Jewish and democratic character. Uh, Thursday week, another thing that I should mention, we have Jonathan Friedland, the Guardian columnist, uh, and also I think a columnist for the Jewish Chronicle in England, also a very strong NIF supporter. He'll be speaking about uh, British Jewry. He'll be speaking about the post-Corbyn era of the Labour Party. Uh, that should be a fascinating conversation. All of those details are on our website. Uh, and with that, I will wrap up at exactly half past nine and say, Martin, you are truly um, we are blessed to have you as our co-patron. We are blessed to have you as a friend. Uh, and we are, I think all, even those outside of the NIF community uh, are blessed to have you uh, as a core part, I think of the institutions of think tanks around foreign policy in the United States, uh, but also as a direct player within the negotiations themselves. I really do hope that we can move out of this crisis, hopefully with a new administration uh, after November's election, and we can move forward towards a more peaceful, uh, and prosperous and just future for Israelis and Palestinians. Thank you so much, Martin, for joining us bright and early uh, out of Washington. Thank you. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. It's very good to uh, see you all again, if only on the small screen. And I uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in person in the not too distant future. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of my friends want to know how well, they can migrate to Australia. So we may all just join you down there. That sounds good. You're welcome anytime. Uh, and we would love to, uh, we would love to have you in person at some point soon. Stay safe. Thank you everyone on the call. Uh, and again, remember, as we approach the end of June, uh, your donations to NIF support some of the most important work that can be done now. Thank you to the almost 300 people who joined the call. Thank you to the dozens of you who asked your questions uh, and have a good evening. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Leah.